So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's virtual field trip to the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station with Samantha Stevens. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope everyone is having a great evening. Before we get started, I just want to mention that all of our August programs are now live on our website. We are offering both virtual and in-person events that adhere to public health guidelines. We'll be offering outdoor yoga, meditation, and forest bathing until September, and you can re register for those at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events. As well, if you have the capacity to support our programs and protect Riverwoods wildlife, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. Before we get to our speaker this evening, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And this evening, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Samantha Stevens, who is a biologist turned photographer. She uses photography to communicate scientific research, especially when that research is relevant to conservation issues. Through her work, she hopes to foster an appreciation for the natural world and the work that helps us understand and protect our shared planet. Samantha is a graduate of the Environmental Visual Communication Program offered by the Royal Ontario Museum and the Fleming College School of Environmental and Natural Resource Sciences. She's a National Geographic Explorer, Girls Who Click Ambassador, and a contributing mem member of the Canid Project. So welcome, Samantha. I have been looking forward to this presentation for a long time. We also have our volunteer George with us today who will be supporting me in the chat bar and any questions that come our way. So thank you, George, for being here. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A section or the comment section if you're watching on Facebook, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So, Samantha, I will pass it over to you, who is currently sitting in Algonquin Park, which I'm sure many of us wish we were as well. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Stephanie. I'm just gonna take a moment to get my screen sharing working here. Does it look good on your end? Looks Perfect. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me this evening for an evening of sharing images and stories about a place that is very near and dear to my heart. I've just realized that I'm not on my beginning slide. There we go. <laughs> All right. And so wherever you are joining from this evening, I hope that it's as cozy as if we were all gathered around a campfire here in Algonquin. Or you can imagine we're all gathered inside this cozy cabin, which is the cookhouse that functions as the hub of activity here at the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station. One of the most enriching aspects of the station is that all the various groups staying here come together at the cookhouse in the evenings to share dinner and share stories about their day and what they're working on. And this results in a wonderful atmosphere of interdisciplinary discussion and collaboration all around a shared passion for the natural world. And although we're all joining virtually this evening, I hope I can inspire those same sentiments during my talk. So the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station is located within Algonquin Provincial Park, although it operates as an independent nonprofit organization. As a field station, its primary function is to provide facilities for researchers and other groups, such as university and college field courses, workshops, natural history film crews, and people like me. So I found myself at the station in 2019. 
earlier in my career, I might have expected to be at a place like the station as a researcher. I studied biology at the graduate level and uh, however, during that experience, I became much more interested in science communication and specifically in using photography as a way to amplify the work that scientists are doing rather than being a scientist myself. So now instead of wielding calipers and pipettes, my tool is the camera. And instead of publishing papers in scientific journals, I work to publish stories about science in magazines. And the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station is full of stories. Now in its 77th year of operation, there is a long and rich history of discovery here. And I'm lucky that it has been my job for the past three years as both an independent photographer and now as a staff member of the station to follow researchers around, learn about their work and create stories to share the importance of their work with a broader audience. Most of the time, I'm the one behind the lens, but once in a while, the researchers turn the camera on me. So here are a couple behind the scenes moments for me at the station photographing small mammal research and Canada J research. So the station welcomes any research group interested in studying the wildlife in the surrounding area, as long as they obtain the proper permits to do so. So there is quite a bit of variety year to year in the research projects. However, in addition to various shorter term projects, the station has been the site of three long term studies that are ongoing today. The youngest of these long-term projects is the Spotted Salamander Project that is pictured here. In this study, both spotted salamanders, as you can see in the photo, and the very similar blue spotted salamanders are counted, weighed, and measured each year as they are intercepted on their spring migration to breed in the lake at this site. This is helping researchers understand how climate affects the body condition of these animals and to estimate various aspects of population dynamics over time, such as the longevity of individuals, so how long an individual lives, for example. The oldest long-term project is the Small Mammal Project. This is a mark recapture study that looks at the abundance of many small mammal species over time in different forest types and in forests that have experienced different types of disturbance, such as logging, for example. And by marking individuals with small metal ear tags and comparing the rate of recapturing these marked individuals to the rate of recapturing, or sorry, first capturing unmarked individuals, researchers can estimate the abundance of various species. In recent years, researchers have also studied parasite communities on small mammals and how these parasites affect their host. And lastly, the third long-term project is the turtle project. This project follows individual snapping turtles shown here and also painted turtles to understand various aspects of their biology. And because I can't keep you here all night telling stories, I've chosen just two projects from the station to tell you more about and the first project that I'm going to delve into is this long-term study on turtles. 
So this summer marks the 50th year of the turtle project, making it the longest continuous study of freshwater turtles in the world. And it all started with the casual curiosity of a group of researchers that were staying at the station. They happened to notice snapping turtles coming to the Lake Sasajewan Dam, a central landmark of the station grounds to lay their eggs. And they wondered if it was the same individuals coming back year after year. And so they placed small metal tags on the shells of a few turtles and so began what turned into the long-term study that continues today. So this is a photo here of a snapping turtle nesting on the Lake Sasajewan Dam. And beside it, you can see uh, the metal tags that the snapping turtles wear. And um, the researchers refer to these as license plates. So each year, there are three phases to the turtle project. The first phase in April and May is the turtle catching phase. And it's mostly focused on painted turtles. In April and May, painted turtles emerge from overwintering sites and they begin basking in the sun. The population of painted turtles that are part of the long-term project reside in two ponds that are adjacent to the Mizzy Lake Trail. So if you're hiking the Mizzy Lake Trail in Algonquin Park, in the spring you'll see the turtle team out in a canoe or mucking around on floating bog mats like Carter is doing here, trying to round up the painted turtles. Each of the turtles in this population has a notch code on their shell and that allows researchers to identify them as individuals. And each year, the individual turtles are brought in for their annual checkup. And so there's a detailed chart that is filled out where they record the turtle's weight, its plastron and carapace length, which are the bottom and top of its shell, and general body condition. This allows researchers to understand things like year-to-year -year survival, longevity, so how long they, the turtles live, and also how growth progresses as the turtle ages. And in recent years, uh, one of the researchers working on this project, Carter, who's pictured here, has taken uh, blood samples from each of the turtles and used that to determine how individuals are related to each other in this population. So for example, which turtles are siblings, which are offspring, or which are more distantly related to one another. And this is an example of how the long-term study can be a baseline for other shorter-term studies um, to be added on, make use of the long-term study, and investigate more and more questions about the lives of turtles. And so after their checkup, before leaving the lab, each turtle has its unique notch code transcribed as a painted number on its shell. Males get red numbers and females get white numbers. And for the rest of the season, this helps researchers identify individuals from afar and observe the turtle's behavior from afar without disturbing the behavior that they're trying to record, such as nesting and basking. And if you've spent some time in the park, perhaps you've seen the turtle car on the road Barry Subaru kindly supports the project by lending a vehicle for the team to use that is wrapped in turtle photos. And here Jenna is loading the turtles into the turtle car so that they can be returned back to their home.
And here is a bunch of painted turtles released back into their home after their yearly checkup. And then the second phase of the turtle field work begins. And this is the nesting phase. So researchers will patrol the sandy embankments along the Mizzy Lake Trail to record which turtles are nesting and mark the locations of the nests. So pictured here is a painted turtle nesting. Painted turtles can start nesting anywhere from around two to three in the afternoon and can continue until well after dark up to around 1 a.m. So these are some long days for the researchers going out and patrolling to try and catch all the turtles nesting. Um, and as well, turtle nesting season coincides with the height of black fly and mosquito season in Algonquin. And so one of the biggest challenges for the researchers is to endure this onslaught, onslaught of biting insects as they're trying to focus on their field work. Here's just another picture of the researchers and their cloud of mosquitoes falling behind. So when a turtle is done nesting, researchers dig up the nest and they count, weigh, and measure the eggs in each nest. And this helps them understand reproductive output over the lifetime of turtles and how it changes as turtles age, for example. Once the eggs have been measured and weighed, they're returned to the nest and the researchers carefully disguise the nest. So during turtle nesting season, researchers are also monitoring for the nesting of snapping turtles in a similar process to the painted turtles. And this is done at various sites throughout the park, including the Lake Sasagiwan Dam, where it all started. Because snapping turtles don't bask in the spring like the, nest, like the painted turtles do, researchers have to wait until nesting season to start encountering the individual. And then they can start bringing the snapping turtles in for their annual checkups. So here is snapping turtle 767, and she is nesting on the road that is right beside the Lake Sasajewan Dam. So then phase three of the turtle project is to catch up with all the snapping turtles that are part of the long-term study and bring them in for their annual checkup, just like the painted turtles. And so that starts with encountering them during nesting. And then after the nesting season, they use uh, traps baited with fish um, to help them catch the snapping turtles and make sure that they can bring in not just the females that they found nesting, but also the males. And here, uh, two of the leaders of the turtle project from this season, Jessica and Claudia, are measuring the carapace length of the largest turtle in the study. He is named Henry, and he is significantly larger than the other turtles in the study, and that is because he lives off the dock on a popular lake where uh, we suspect that he gets a lot of uh, hot dogs and ice cream cones that supplement his uh, natural diet. Uh, so you can why study turtles for 50 plus years? And that's because turtles live their life in the slow lane. 
they grow slowly, and they live a very long time. So to understand even the basics of their biology requires dedicating decades to studying them. So how long do snapping turtles live? Once they reach a certain size, there are no physical characteristics that give away a snapping turtle's age. So one can only be sure of a turtle's age if that individual had been followed since they hatched. By marking individual turtles and measuring how they grow year to year over their entire lifespan, researchers here are working to solve the mystery of how to tell a turtle's age. And this is where muddy boots in the field meet mathematical models back in the lab or office. And so by measuring many turtles and how they grow as they age helps build models that can help researchers estimate a turtle's age more accurately um, when unknown turtles are encountered um, by measuring them and using this information about size related to age to help age unknown turtles. So the oldest known turtle in the study is at the very least 65 years old. She has been followed since the first year of the study as a mature female. So she had to have been at least 16 years old already when the researchers encountered her nesting. And so only time will tell how long she will live and how long the rest of the turtles in the turtle study will live. And so we are still waiting on an answer as to how long these turtles live. I'm just going to take a sip of water before going into the next story that I'll share with you. So northern pitcher plants are carnivorous plants and being carnivorous allows them to survive in nutrient poor bog environments. In these bog environments, there is no rich soil, but rather a floating mat of sphagnum moss. So instead of being able to draw nutrients up through their roots, this plant relies on trapping prey in its specialized bell-shaped leaves called pitchers. So typically these plants feast on invertebrates such as moss and flies. But in 2018, researchers here at the station discovered a new item on the northern pitcher plants menu, and that is juvenile spotted salamanders. So this population of northern pitcher plants in Algonquin Park is the first to be found regularly consuming a vertebrate prey. So pictured here is the silhouette of a juvenile spotted salamander that is trapped within a pitcher, which is one leaf belonging to the pitcher plant as a whole. So a salamander's life cycle spans two worlds both the aquatic world and the terrestrial world. So spotted salamanders start their lives as an embryo in a gelatinous egg mass suspended in a shallow vernal pool, which is a temporary collection of water or a pond or a lake. They then hatch into tadpole-like larvae in late spring and by late summer or early autumn, they metamorphose into their terrestrial form, referred to as metamorphs or juveniles. 
And so that juvenile stage is um, pictured here on the bottom right. And it's at this stage that they will leave their natal aquatic habitat and travel to the adjacent forest seeking overwintering sites beneath the forest floor. And at a particular site in Algonquin Park, that journey involves traversing a bog mat where pitcher plants lie in wait. And then for the remainder of their life, which on average spans seven to 15 years, although individuals have been found and estimated to be over 30 years old, spotted salamanders largely live underground and they only return to the water to breed in the spring. So the adult spotted salamander is pictured on the top right here. And then on the left, you can see the adult salamander compared to the juvenile salamander. And these juvenile salamanders are only about three centimeters long. So they're just small enough to get trapped within the pitcher plant's leaves. And salamanders have long been recognized as important nutrient cyclers in forest ecosystems. As they move between their terrestrial and aquatic sites, they redistribute nutrients between the two habitat types. They also feed on soil invertebrates, many of which are involved in decomposition. And so in this way, they slow the rate of leaf litter breakdown on the forest floor. Although we may not see them often because of their underground lifestyle, salamanders are actually extremely abundant in the forest ecosystems of North America, which is the world's salamander diversity hotspot. In fact, there have been some studies that estimate that in some places, the biomass, which is the combined weight of all living individuals of salamanders may rival that of other larger vertebrates that are on the landscape, such as moose or bears. And so for a northern pitcher plant that is used to capturing relatively small invertebrate prey, a juvenile spotted salamander is quite the feast. A single salamander would provide the plants with a much larger dose of an essential nutrient, nitrogen, than their typical insect prey would. And although nitrogen is an essential nutrient important for plant growth and reproduction, it could possibly be harmful to plants in very large doses. So the question remains as to whether the plants can even take up this uh, large dose of nitrogen at all, or whether instead of being beneficial, it may be harmful to the plants. So researchers are currently using isotope analysis to assess whether the nitrogen signature from the salamanders is present within the tissue of the pitcher plants. So that will tell us whether the plants are actually able to consume the salamander prey. So often in science, when one question is answered, it opens up a cascade of further questions. And this salamander eating pitcher plant discovery is no exception. So following the initial discovery, Amanda Semenik, who's uh, photographed here doing her fieldwork, joined the project as a Master of Science candidate with the University of Guelph. And she began leading uh, the research on this project 
to answer these uh, following questions. So Amanda spends her late summer and fall evenings sloshing through a bog, recording the status of salamander prey caught in each picture of the study's plants. And she is also measuring various physical characteristics of the pitcher plants themselves. So sometimes the pitcher plants fluid can get quite murky with decomposed prey. So Amanda is using a turkey baster here to help uh, better see what is contained within the fluid. And after drying up the fluid and taking a look, she then returns it to the pitcher plant. So as I alluded to, there are many questions being investigated in Amanda's study, including um, questions like how and why are the salamanders ending up in the pictures in the first place? Are they just accidentally falling into the pictures as they cross the bog mat? Are they attracted to the insect prey caught within the pitcher um, for their own meal? Or are they attracted to some other aspect of the pitcher plants? And she is also asking questions uh, about the plants, such as what characteristics of the pitchers make certain pitchers successful in capturing salamander prey? So do pictures of a certain size, a certain orientation towards the water where the salamanders are coming from, or pictures of a certain age catch more salamanders? So what is it about the pictures that are catching the salamanders? And after uh, observing some interesting um, things during her survey. She's also asking some questions about these um, observations, such as how are some of the salamanders managing to escape the pitchers? Are they able to finally pull themselves out or does heavy rain overflow the pitchers and give the salamanders a boost? Or is there maybe some other predator that's coming along and picking the salamanders out of the pitchers? Another interesting observation from this project has been that it's only spotted salamanders that are getting trapped in the pitcher plants, but not the very similar blue spotted salamanders that are also present in this area. And the spotted and blue spotted salamanders are very, very similar species. And it's quite curious that only the spotted salamanders have been found trapped in the pitchers. So it also brings up questions of why it's just the spotted salamanders. What is it about them compared to the blue spotted salamanders um, that is resulting in them falling prey to the pitcher plant? So here is a photo of Hayden, who's helping Amanda with her surveys, and he is illuminating an entire pitcher plant. So you can see that the plant is made up of a variety of these pitcher leaves that all belong to a single individual plant. And so he's looking to use his light to reveal silhouettes of salamanders trapped inside. And this is one great part about the field station is that not only are researchers working on their own projects, but because there's so many different projects occurring at the station at the same time, people get to go out and experience many different types of field work and get to experience many different, um, get to observe many different wildlife and experience different types of field work. And here is an image of a pitcher that has caught two salamanders. So there is the silhouette of one 
salamander that is deceased and sunk to the bottom of the picture. And then on top is the plant's most recent prey, a salamander that is still alive and swimming on the surface. And that brings me to the last image that I have to share this evening. I had been photographing this fieldwork for a while by this time, joining the re research team on their daily survey of this population of plants when we came across this scene. And although there have been pictures that have caught multiple salamanders at a time, like the one that I just showed you. Um, most often the pictures just have one uh, salamander prey at a time. And so when we saw this one with two salamanders floating at the surface of the pitcher plants fluid in the same stage of decomposition, uh, I knew that it was a really unique scene and and would lend itself well to photography. So I will leave you with this final image. And the final um, thought that I'll share with you from this project is that this discovery of salamander eating pitcher plants was made in a place that has been frequented by naturalists and researchers for um, many decades over the 77 years that the research station has been around. And the fact that this interaction went unnoticed during that time is uh, a testament to the fact that we still have so much to learn about the way that species interact with each other in the natural world, even in places like our backyards. Um, and I guess the, this station has been the backyard of many researchers who have come to live here and observe the natural world. And I have one um, final slide that just gives you a little bit of um, information about how to continue to follow the work of the station. So there's some links there if you'd like to follow the station on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And you can also um, follow my work, which largely focuses on the station on Instagram. And lastly, the station does have a Patreon page. And this is a place where you can sign up to be a member and help our research, support our science by um, contributing even just $1 a month um, to help run our programs here. And unfortunately, the station has been quite affected by COVID. We've been lucky to be able to continue the three long-term projects over the past couple of years. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to open up our doors to field courses and larger groups. And since that's the primary way that we maintain the station. Um, we very much appreciate everyone who's been able to sign up as a member through Patreon and help us keep the station sustained throughout this difficult time for everyone. So with that, I will wrap up and say that I'm happy to answer questions. I can take questions on photography, on the station, on the various research projects. Of course, I'm not the researcher myself on some of these projects, so I'll do my very best to try and answer any questions about that. And if I don't know the answer, I know this is being recorded, so maybe I can post a follow-up comment once I bring those questions to the researchers if I can't answer them myself. So, Stephanie, I will turn it over to you then to moderate the Q&A. Yeah, that yeah. was great, Samantha. That was so awesome. Your photos are just honestly some of the best that I've ever seen. And I'm I'm not lying to you. I oh, love those. Flattered. Yeah, no, I love those images of uh, the salamanders and the pitcher plants. They're just the neatest things ever. I think they're they're really unique photographs. So you should be so proud. I'm sure you are proud, but I just wanted to say that too. Um, if it wasn't about actually uh, people being shocked about the uh, 
the pitcher plants eating the salamanders, a lot of people were also shocked about how long the salamanders live. You said, I think, seven to 15 years. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah, that's what has been reported seven to 15 years. And there have been a couple um, reports of salamanders, like I mentioned, being estimated to be up to 30 years. But yeah, the salamanders are quite a bit more long lived than one might assume. And one of the aspects of the, um, the long term salamander project that I very briefly mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation um, is that they are actually um, marking some of the individuals encountered on that yearly spring migration and um, seeing if the, how they uh, if they recapture those same individuals year after year and that helps us learn how long these salamanders are living for. And one helpful thing about spotted salamanders that really allows the researchers to do that is that um, the yellow spot pattern on each individual is actually unique. So they can um, mark the salamanders, which indicates that they are one of the special ones that we're looking to recapture. And then by photographing them, they can then match that, those records up year after year. And we can see how long. So cool. <laughs> really, yeah. really cool. Um, so we had a couple more questions come in. Um, somebody said, what is the youngest and the oldest age of the turtles that you are researching? Or I guess that the turtle researchers are researching. Good question. Yeah, so um, the youngest, we, uh, we do encounter little hatchling turtles um, that, you know, are just like one year old, um, but we can't actually mark a turtle when it's that young because um, there just isn't a good way of doing that because they're so tiny when they're that young and they grow so quickly in the first um, few years that it's really hard to mark them. Um, and so a lot of the turtles that enter the study enter as mature individuals. And so that's when they are coming up to nest for the first time. And so um, they are, the snapping turtles are around um, 16 to 20 years old already when they're coming up to nest for the first time. And um, I, for oldest individual, I had mentioned there was um, one turtle that was tagged in the very first year of the study. So back when those researchers thought, oh, I wonder if the turtles coming up onto the dam are the same individuals. And they placed a tag in 1972 on the snapping turtle who um, would have had to be at least 16 or 20 um, years old at that point because she was coming up to nest. And so that makes her at the very least 65 years old, but that could be a very conservative estimate because she could have been quite a bit older when she was first encountered. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to, to know exactly. We'll have to, there are um, now a couple cohorts of turtles that they um, have been able to find a way to follow since they hatched. And those turtles right now are all around, I think 35 years old. So only time will tell um, for these turtles that we for sure have um, a hatch year for who are 35 right now. So we'll just have to wait and see wow. how much longer those turtles live. So awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody on Facebook mm -hmm. actually just said, happy to be um, a WRS Wolfpack Patreon. So I guess that's the, the highest tier oh, nice. Patreon. Yes. <laughs> yeah, which is Thank awesome. Thank you. We appreciate your support so much. Yeah, yes. that was Steve <laughs> who said that. So uh, shout out to Steve. Yes. Um, Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, Judith has said, did you hand hold the photo of the last salamander? So I guess, did you hold the camera or did you have it on a tripod or how did you take that last photo? 
Yeah, great photography question. Um, I was actually hand holding the camera for that photo, which yeah, was quite difficult. Um, <laughs> because I was using a I was using a, a special lens. It's a wide angle macro lens. So if you know about photography, that might mean something to you. Um, and uh, you can only manually focus it. So of course I was trying to sort of balance on the bog mat and uh, bend down and look into this picture and sort of maneuver the camera while also trying to manually focus and hold it still. And I have a bunch of lights going on there too. So yeah, it's a, it definitely takes a lot of patience to compose those photos, but um, having a tripod on the, uh, bog mat is actually not really an option just because um, the thin legs puncture through the bog mat and trying to um, have as minimal an effect on the bog mat as possible and it also just would fall over so <laughs> yeah hand holding is the only option unfortunately. Um, yeah, and, and somebody actually said, could we see that last picture again now that you have discussed it? I guess if you could just um, share your screen one last oh, time sure. of that last photo. I think everybody is just like blown away. Yeah, by I think it should. <laughs> okay, I think. Oh, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, so for this photo, I had a, actually a headlamp behind the picture that is sort of backlighting the picture and giving it that glow and creating the silhouette of the salamanders. And then there's another uh, light that is coming at it from the front just a little bit um, to light up the front as well. <laughs> now I have my own question, Samantha. Um, sometimes it's hard to interfere yeah. with nature. Like I know as naturalists, we always are like, don't interfere with nature, but you also have this love for wildlife. So is it hard sometimes seeing these salamanders in the pictures <laughs> slowly being consumed, basically? <laughs> yeah, of course. It is really hard. And it's, I mean, yes, the short answer is yes, that it is hard um, to see a predator, any predator prey mm -hmm. uh, interaction play out because you always feel empathy for the prey. But of course, we all understand that this is a necessary part of the circle of life. And it's just a fact of life that these predator prey interactions need to happen. And so, yes, people have asked, you know, why don't you take the salamanders out of the pictures when you find them? And it's hard, but, you know, the plant has to eat and the plant has come up with a strategy to be able to eat. And so taking the salamanders out of the pictures would just be causing the pitchers harm and then they wouldn't be able to survive. So yeah, and certainly um, as wildlife biologists, you know, and or conservationists, there are some situations like helping a turtle cross the road that you would interfere. Right. And for me, that's only when an animal has come to harm for uh a human, some sort of human cause. So turtles being hit on the road or, you know, an animal trapped in a fence that humans have put up or something like that. But when it's a naturally occurring process like this, just got to let nature take its course. That is a great answer, Samantha. I love that. I just felt like there was someone out there thinking that. So <laughs> that's why I asked. That's awesome. Yes, there definitely many people are. I promise sure. I am an empathetic and yeah. uh, nice human that I can't take the sound of this. Yes, we totally understand. Um, and then there was another question a while ago that uh, we just had two more questions. Um, what do turtles eat? Hmm, good question. Um, they eat a lot of fish. Um, they'll eat vegetation. So yeah, the snapping turtles, actually one of their roles in the ecosystem is that they scavenge for dead fish in lakes and they help um, maintain water quality that way. So that's an important role that they play. Um, and yeah, the, the painted turtles will 
eat vegetation as well. Um, they might eat other things that I'm not quite sure about, but that's no. the answer that I can give you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'm sure they're not supposed to be eating hot dogs and ice cream cones like um, the big turtle is eating. <laughs> definitely not. No, right? definitely not. <laughs> Um, and there was just one last question that came in and asked um, if we have spotted salamanders in Mississauga. Um, I don't know if you know the range of spotted salamanders. Um, do you know mm. that, Samantha? Uh, my instinct is to say yes, mm -hmm. because they are fairly widespread. Right. Um, certainly there are salamanders of some type in Mississauga, and I'm pretty pretty sure that there's spotted salamanders but that might be one that you have to google right my, <laughs> or, uh, i have to ask the salamander expert <laughs> right i'm just thinking right now uh, we have a our conservation specialist on site derek would probably know the answer to that i'm going to actually say that uh, at riverwood specifically we do not have spotted salamanders and i'm this is a guess okay. but we're 150 acres, but it's pretty much covered by or surrounded by um, roads and and subdivisions and things like that. Like it's kind of it's not fragmented, but it, it's it's pretty surrounded. We do have red back salamanders, which are the smaller ones, and we have yeah. blue spotted salamanders. Very rarely we have those as well. But okay. I have never heard about. Okay. Spotted salamanders, which would be super cool. I'm sure they're in Mississauga, but I'm not sure at Riverwood. So that's a good question. And probably a really good thing to leave our, us on is that uh, everybody would go home and do a little bit of research. Because <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm very, uh, become very familiar with Algonquin, but right. I have uh, yet to learn more about <laughs> everywhere else in Ontario. Well, I was much like you, Samantha. I, uh, I worked in Algonquin when I was younger and moving south, like it's completely different. Like you have to, it's almost like relearning all the wildlife again, which is fun. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes keeps it exciting <laughs> exactly um so thank you so much again samantha i don't know if you want to go to your last slide um just to plug kind yeah, of sure. on and stuff again um for those that are interested in contributing to the work at wrs they're doing awesome awesome research and it's really contributing to our understanding of all ontario uh biodiversity and even in canada i would say too so um, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful images with us tonight. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. Okay. Everyone's saying in the chat today, um, <laughs> great work, awesome images, and uh, they just love the presentation. So thank you again, Samantha, for joining us. And um, thanks so much. <laughs> you have a great it's been evening. So nice. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> and I hope to um, connect with those who came to the presentation on maybe one of the station platforms or through Riverwood Conservancy sometime in the future. So that would thanks. be awesome. <laughs> thanks so much, Samantha. Everyone have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye.